May I speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please sit down. So, the history of the Jewish people in the Hebrew Bible is full of adventure. It's full of a people who were chosen by God, who followed him, who turned away from him and turned back to him. They became slaves, were liberated, praised God, and then stopped trusting him. They were promised a land of their own, but had to wait 40 years for it because of their lack of faith. When they finally did get their own land, they carried on, turning towards God and falling away again. Eventually, they split their land into two, the northern Israel and the southern Judah, with Jerusalem being the capital of Judah. Even then, they carried on being difficult with God. Eventually, Israel was conquered by the Neo-Assyrian Empire, and about 150 years later, <laughs> Judah was conquered by the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Now, the Babylonians had a really clever way to make sure that conquered people didn't rise up against them. The ruling classes, along with the educated elite, were taken into exile in Babylon. They were treated reasonably well, given jobs with status, and shown the benefits of becoming part of the mighty Babylonian Empire. And the hope was that they would effectively become Babylonians. The empire would benefit from having new, clever people bringing their skills and the people left behind would find it more difficult to rise up against their conquerors as all their leaders were gone. Now, this worked reasonably well for the Babylonians for a time. Unfortunately for them, Cyrus the Great, who was Persian, decided that he'd quite like to own all of the Babylonian land himself. And so about 60 to 70 years after the Jewish exile, the Persians conquered Babylon. The families of the Jewish exiles were then allowed to return to Judah if they wished. So that's the background to the story of Nehemiah, which we're going to look at over the next couple of months. Nehemiah was a Jewish man his family would have been part of the exile. We don't know how old he was or anything much about him, but as the exile lasted for up to 70 years, we can assume that he was probably born in Babylon. This opening chapter tells us how he had a visitor who told him about the really poor condition of the city of Jerusalem, the walls broken down, and the gates burned by fire. This really touched Nehemiah's heart, and he broke down and wept, and then prayed to God about it. Now, three things about this passage really spoke to me. And the first was that Nehemiah was upset to the point of crying about a city he had probably never seen certainly never lived in. Why was this city, which he had no personal connection with, so important to him? He was Jewish, of course, and his parents would have been part of that cohort of bright young people who were taken away by the Babylonians. Possibly it was even his grandparents that were part of that group. He would have been brought up on stories of Jerusalem, of its size and strength, of its wonderful temple built by Solomon, and stories of the God who cared for his people and whose presence on earth was in that temple. His family history would have been so bound up with the city that although he'd never been there, he felt that it was home. The second thing that struck me was the intensely personal way he reacted. 
Now, most people, well, me, um, <laughs> when hearing of a disaster, even one which happened in a place which means a lot to me, would, would feel sad, may even give some money to a charity to help out. But we wouldn't necessarily react in the way Nehemiah did. He sat down and wept and mourned for days, not for five minutes, for days, fasting. That is a really extreme reaction. It was like he had a real burden on his heart for the plight of the city. The third thing that struck me was his prayer to God. Now, I don't know about you, but I can be a real moaning mini when I pray. I can't count the number of times I've asked God, how could you let that happen? Honestly, there are times when, when I'm talking to God, I'm just like a sulky teenager, just really having a go at him. Uh, he probably goes, oh, not you again. <laughs> but Nehemiah doesn't do that. There's no indication that he puts any blame on God at all. Instead, he starts off with praising God. O oh Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, whose covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. He then goes on to put all the blame on himself, his family, and the whole of the people. He acknowledges their offences and repents of their sins. He then goes on to remember that God had told Moses that this would happen that if the people were unfaithful to God, they would be scattered among the nations. But he also remembers that God promised that if the people returned to him, he would gather them together again and bring them back in the place he had chosen to establish his name, that is, Jerusalem. Nehemiah's image of God was one of power, of kept promises, of mercy, of a God who delights in listening to his people. It's an image that we would do well to remember. For us today, I think we can learn some important lessons from Nehemiah. Firstly, I think we can learn how vital it is to hand on our faith. One of the joys of a community of believers is that it should be intergenerational. I love having children in the church. Having a shaker during the first hymn just lifted my heart so much this morning, I can tell you. And it was really sad not to have all the children's services we normally have at Christmas this year, although of course it was absolutely right to cancel them. But the Christmas Eve crib service here, as well as the nativity services at St Mary's, are often the only service that some families attend in a year. The joy of seeing grandparents, parents and children coming to hear the Christmas story, of learning about their heritage as people of God, is amazing. I love hearing about grandparents bringing their grandchildren to toddler's praise. This is how we pass on our faith, as well as by bedtime Bible stories, stories of how God works in our lives, and of course, by example. If Nehemiah's family had not passed on all their stories, he would indeed have been a Babylonian he wouldn't even have asked after Jerusalem, let alone be affected by its plight. Secondly, I think we need to understand that the weight, the burden he felt for Jerusalem was put there by God. We hear so many stories about awful things that happen in our world, in our country, in our local community, even to people in our church. We can't solve 
every problem that is out there. If we try to sort everything out, we end up sorting out nothing. There's so much need around us. But we can help one thing, one situation, one person. What burden is God putting on your heart right now? It might simply be that God wants us to give up some time to help the church out. There are plenty of roles that can be done by someone with no experience, such as giving out the um, sheets at the beginning, welcoming people. No experience, but an open heart and a ready smile are always welcome. There are roles that need a bit more specific knowledge. We're desperate for musicians, for people who are a bit more tech savvy, and so on. It might be that God wants you to volunteer for a food bank. Maybe the, the plight of people who are hungry is on your heart. To donate to a homeless charity, to help at the local school. There's no shortage of need out there. Where is God guiding you? It might be useful to spend some time thinking about the various things you could do and asking God to let you know where he wants you to be and then accepting that if your heart is burdened by something in particular, maybe it's because God has put that burden on you. And I think the third thing we learned from this passage is of course the power of prayer and how to pray. In our gospel reading, Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray. The Lord's Prayer in Luke is short, much shorter than Nehemiah's prayer, but it covers a lot of the same ground. It recognises the greatness of God. Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. God is so great that even his name is holy. The prayer recognises his kingship, his sovereignty. It goes on. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. It's a prayer of repentance, like Nehemiah's prayer, as well as a promise to try and do better ourselves. The phrase is, give us each day our daily bread, and also, do not bring us to the time of trial, are prayers for ourselves, just as Nehemiah finished up his prayer with asking for God's help for himself. Both of these prayers are templates that we can use in our own prayer lives. So, as we journey through Nehemiah's story over the next few weeks, I'm sure we'll be learning many other new things that can help us to develop as the people that God wants us to be. But even when we've finished with this story, my hope and my prayer for us all is that we will remember the importance of handing on our faith, of listening to where God is pointing to us, and of course, the importance of prayer. <laughs>